Welcome. This is the Earthquake Country Alliance, Southern California Spring 2022 workshop. We have many more people still joining us and we're really glad you could join us uh, with the change that we've done from an in-person and Zoom to Zoom only. A little bit of, uh, of being flexible and we, we appreciate everyone's flexibility. Earthquake Country Alliance is a statewide organization with 4,000 or uh, plus public private grassroots leaders such as yourselves. We have statewide committees, regional alliances that organize resources, activities, webinars, workshops like this. Our support comes from the California Office of Emergency Services, which provides NEHER funding, uh, which I'll explain in a second, for our earthquake activities, earthquake mitigation activities, these workshops, everything that we do. And we're administered uh, by my home organization, the Southern California Earthquake Center uh, at USC. My name is Mark Benthe, an executive director. And again, welcome to those who've just joined uh, and uh, our speakers and everyone here today. To join the Earthquake Country Alliance, just simply go to earthquakecountry.org slash join. It's a simple form, it's free. You'll make, make sure you'll be able to get on our email list to receive our updates and information and, and notices of these workshops and other activities. I mentioned NEHRP, that stands for the National Earthquake Hazards Reduction Program. And each year, the, California, the uh, Governor's Office of, of Emergency Services applies to FEMA for that funding, which is then subawarded to us at the University of Southern California, Southern California Earthquake Center to administer ECA's earthquake education, outreach and mitigation activities. And NEHRP is one of four federal agents, agencies that work together, FEMA, the NIST, NSF, USGS, you see at the bottom here, to uh, really reduce the, the losses of earthquakes um, around the country. And we also have support from several of those organizations. On a statewide level, we have our website at earthquakecountry.org and in Spanish at terremotos.org. With really, a, uh, we try to have a, a, all of our resources there and, and a great place to send people if they're asking how to they get prepared to survive and recover from earthquakes. We have the seven steps to earthquake safety, web pages, and many other resources that you can download. We support Tsunami Preparedness Week each year at tsunamizone.org uh, slash California. That just happened in March, but there's year-round resources that you can access there. And of course, you can have a tsunami activity or drill or, or learn about tsunami year-round and learn about, um, to know your zone, what to do if you're near the shore. You can go to that website. We created back in 2008, the UCA SoCal, uh, we created the first shakeout called Great Southern California Shakeout as a one-time event. Uh, and then it went uh, with interest from the rest of the state, uh, became a statewide uh, drill and then grew beyond that. And of course, registration is open. We encourage you to participate this year. As always, shakeouts on the third Thursday of October, which is October 20th, though you can register your drill to have it on any day of the year. And also at earthquakecountry.org slash calendar, you'll find uh, we're adding more and more webinars and other events, and that's a, um, linked from the homepage too. We have eight sector-based outreach committees to, uh, that you can be a part of. If, if you see your sector here or know someone who uh, is a part of one of these sectors, uh, you can join us to help create content materials and webinars and uh, for your sector uh, to make sure that uh, it is having the needed information to be prepared for earthquakes and tsunamis. We go to earthquakecountry.org slash committees to find out how to participate. We also have outreach bureaus uh, that are uh, act active at both the regional and statewide level. We have an events bureau with speakers. And uh, now that we're having in-person events when we tried, um, for, um, booths and tables at events. And if you'd like to request a speaker or uh, uh, us to come out and be at your event, go to earthquakecountry.org slash events to fill out a simple form uh, to request uh, someone. We also have uh, um, bureaus that focus on 
recruitment for ShakeOut, the Participation Bureau, and Tsunami Week, uh, and um, a statewide and local media bureau. So if you're a public information officer uh, with an organization or a government agency or with the media or would like to be a part of that, let us know. You can always email info at earthquakecountry.org for any questions about what we've been sharing here. I mentioned the seven steps to earthquake safety, really the key way that we organize our information uh, and kind of what to do before, during, and after. So lots of great resources now supporting the, um, that information. You can see we have that uh, web pages and that in English, earthquakecountry.org slash seven steps and in Spanish, terremotos.org slash CFA Pasos. We're very pleased to have been able to uh, translate many of our resources and create some new ones um, that, uh, into 14 languages. So we now with English have a total of mater uh, these materials in 15 languages, which you can find at earthquakecountry.org slash languages. And we recently created a web page for each of those languages with just those materials. So if you know someone who uh, needs resources in, in one of the 15 languages, you can point them to either this page or for that specific page, such as earthquakecountry.org slash Chinese or slash Korean, et cetera. You'll find that link on this page. If you've just joined again, welcome to the ECA Southern California Spring 2022 workshop. Just as uh, because a number of people have just joined, I'm gonna show again as a regular Zoom meeting, please do keep your, your sound on, I'm sorry, your sound muted, but your camera on. Uh, we do have interpreters uh, with us today, sign language interpreters that you'll see in the video. And there is a live transcript that you can follow along uh, um, if needed. And we ask that you ask any questions within the chat. And there may be times during the Q&A portions where uh, we'll call on people to either speak those questions or we'll read them out loud for you. With that, I'd like to introduce uh, the chairs of ECA SoCal, who will, uh, I believe you're gonna introduce yourselves. Yes, we are. Uh, we uh, definitely are doing that. Um, Alan, you wanna go ahead? Uh, sure, so, well, first of all, I'm so disappointed that we didn't get to have this as a face-to-face -face event. We had planned for the last six months to do that and we'll have to do it again in the future. So anyway, my name is Alan Hansen. Um, I was uh, was employed by Simpson Strong Tie until I retired four years ago and again was looking forward to going back to the facility and having the event there. But we'll have to put that off. We went to the uh, California Emergency Services Association uh, conference last week, um, Gabby and I, and evidently some folks caught COVID. So that's why we had to change it to a virtual event. So anyway, there you go. That's my story and I'm sticking to it. Thank you. I'm Heidi Rosofsky and uh, I'm a uh, inclusive planning specialist with the Global Vision Consortium and have been one of the co-chairs for a number of years, as well as participating in uh, uh, expanding access to uh, both languages and other um, functional access and functional needs. So I will then turn it over to Margaret. Hey, thank you, Heidi and Alan. And I am Margaret Vinci, manager of the Office of Earthquake Programs at Caltech, and also the Southern California Regional Coordinator for Shake Alert Earthquake Early Warning, and one of your three Earthquake Country Alliance co-chairs. Uh, we coordinate the Southern California leadership, which is comprised of the following committees that you're looking at on the slide. And so first of all, we want to, the co-chairs, uh, we want to acknowledge each of our committee leaders and committee members for the excellent job that they are doing, maintaining and providing the stability, integrity and resources of the Earthquake Country Alliance program throughout the year, um, working on our common goals of earthquake mitigation and making our communities safer. So we currently, looking at the list, you can see that we currently have two, two positions open. Uh, first of all, the regional workshop coordinator that would then plan these workshops that you're attending now. That also is in collaboration with the whole leadership committee, so it's not just you alone. Uh, we also have an open position for membership coordinator, 
And so we actually have an open invitation to all of our ECA members to consider sitting on one of our state uh, committees that, uh, that Mark mentioned, or one of our local committees uh, listed here. And, uh, and you can also look at these positions. They're posted on our website at earthquakecountry.org backslash SoCal if you want to read more about each one of these positions and show, have any interest in them. Um, you can also, and I think, uh, Gabby, if you can put in the chat, uh, anybody interested in any positions can go to SoCal at earthquakecountry.org and just send an email to us letting know your interest and we will then contact you. So we have currently this year created a new position for a ShakeOut Tsunami Events Coordinator. And I'm proud to announce that Pauline Louie, who is our senior analyst with the US Department of Housing and Urban Development has graciously accepted to lead this committee. And so I'm now gonna turn it over as an introduction to Pauline to get you to know who she is and kind of ask for your help. Pauline? Yeah, hi, hi Margaret, mm -hmm. so much. And um, this is Pauline Louie, Senior Analyst from the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development in Region 9, which is the Pacific uh, uh, and West region. And I'm currently in the Los Angeles office. And I'm so delighted to kind of, uh, you know, to be chairing the, uh, the ShakeOut uh, event coordination. And, um, you know, it is the flagship event of the year for ECA and uh, has a lot of excitement and a lot of exposure for the work that we all do year round. Uh, the shakeout this year is Thursday, October 20th. So everybody mark your calendars and save the date. Uh, part of my job uh, for, for the next few months is to um, pull together all of the different uh, parts of, of ECA, all the different sectors, to start working on certain components leading up to that day. While there will be multiple events and multiple sites that will be doing uh, shakeout activities, hopefully all of, uh, all of our sites, all of our organizations will be doing it. Um, there will be a couple that will probably be a showcase um, and one in particular that will be the, the focus of the media event that will occur probably that morning. So we are working uh, towards that right now. Within the next, I would say, month, month and a half, we should be able to uh, really settle on that one uh, site, one uh, kind of location that we will have the media event in. Uh, so I'm asking all of the folks who are currently working with the um, with the sectors uh, to kind of think about and reach out to your partners to think about. Uh, uh, and to talk about who might already have some um, a plan or an activity scheduled for that day. And it could be that we want to piggyback on that and have that as our big media, ev media event for that day. So um, thank you for having me and I'm gonna send it back to Margaret. Okay, thank you, Pauline. And if anybody wants to join her committee, uh, please let us know or let Pauline know. Pauline, I don't know if you want your email in the chat, but otherwise, again, contact SoCal at earthquakecountry.org and let us know your interest. And I'm now going to turn it over to Heidi, who's going to talk about the calendar. Yeah, and also the what, what, uh, thank you, Margaret. What, what, what we said about Pauline's committee is true for all of the committees. If you have an interest in any one of the committees in terms of joining it to help promote the work that's being done in that sector or whatever, we'd love to hear from you and uh, enfold you into the wonderful group of people that work together to put on things such as our calendar. Today, you are at the spring workshop. May 17th, we have uh, a community engagement webinar uh, with the partnering with the Coachella Valley D Disaster Preparedness Network. In June, we are going to go south to San Diego and uh, put. we're in the process of putting together a webinar for um, uh, organizations and, and uh, community members and so forth in, in the uh, Southern area. Um, uh, the great checkout that, that uh, Pauline mentioned is coming up faster than you may think. And then uh, on the 9th is the ECA uh, SoCal Fall Workshop. Uh, we'd also like to know more about what you guys are doing. So if you have something um, that, that is uh, earthquake uh, preparedness or earthquake connected, uh, that, then uh, you know, be sure you get in touch with us so that we can try and help uh, co-promote each other's events to get the word out to uh, 
the community as a whole. Uh, and if you go to earthquakecountry.org backslash SoCal, you'll also find the list of, of, uh, of uh, activities that are going on and uh, any changes like what happened with this one going from uh, pers uh, in, in phase to a Zoom, we all have to be flexible. So uh, be sure you check in with that, uh, that page too to find out what else is going on. Today's agenda, uh, we will be uh, talking about the ECA statewide updates, uh, the 2022 calendar, which we sort of just went over. And we also have today, um, we're highlighting the SoCal Mini Grant Award uh, um, recipients and the projects that they uh, were, that they uh, put together and completed. And the, uh, the mini award project is an annual thing. So make sure that you check into that as well so that you can uh, either get the word out to your partners or to, uh, to maybe even put together uh, something of your own. We will then go into uh, Margaret Vincy's Quake Breaks, which uh, talks about seismic activity since the last workshop. Then we're going to have a wonderful presentation on what's the story on soft story retrofits. And soft stories are some of the buildings that you see, like where the garage may be underneath or something like that. But we'll learn more about that thanks to uh, Daniel Zapita and the wonderful presentation that he is going to be providing. Uh, and towards the end of the uh, our event here today, we're gonna to have an open discussion and an opportunity to find out who's doing what and helping you connect to one another so that you can force multiply each other's um, work and events. And with that, I will uh, kick it over to Mark. Thank you, Heidi. All right, we are um, now going to have presentations by our mini award recipients for this year. And just a brief overview, if you aren't aware, the ECA mini awards program provides materials for ECA member projects that improve earthquake resilience. We uh, make purchases and then provide the materials to the recipients from $500 to $1,000 each. And uh, we do that by reviewing proposals that are submitted uh, in the fall uh, for earthquake mitigation and education activities. We provide a, a set of, of uh, like a catalog of, of packages, but you can also create your own. And so you can start thinking now about what you might do uh, as part of this uh, and uh, be ready to apply in the fall. So part of, uh, of going through uh, and having our, our recipients present is to give you ideas for what you can do as a mini award program or project of your own, but also really what you could do on your own at any time. So this type of work is um, uh, something that you may not want to wait until the fall to see whether you're selected to do this. You might want to get this started now. It really does not uh, necessarily cost a lot to do this work. The benefit is really significant if you secured things so they won't fall or fly or uh, and, and hit people or be damaged uh, or you know maybe start a fire uh, or block exits uh, so that people can, can't get out or even rescuers can't come in. So doing this type of work is really key for that as well as uh, providing educational resources and community um, trainings and, and uh, organizations as some of our recipients have done. Okay, so I'm kind of showing this slide so that our um, participants who are with us today, who are, um, are many award recipients, can see the order of the slides. So everybody kind of get a sense of, of who's before you. Uh, I will be calling out your name as we start each presentation. So uh, Janice, uh, I believe uh, if you could turn your camera on and uh, you are up first, and I'll advance your slides for you. Good morning. My name is Janice. 
we are, I am from Service Center for Independent Life. Um, Skill is one of 28 independent living centers in the state of California. We provide services to all persons with a disability and seniors. Our mission statement is Skill seeks to empower all persons with any disability in their quest to greater personal independence and to advocate for a barrier-free society. We are located in Claremont um, and we service um, 22 cities in the East Los Angeles County and East San Gabriel and Pomona Valleys. We have been given the opportunity to receive this mini award and we received 20 ECA home fastening starter kits. Um, our overall goal was to introduce, introduce this starter kit to the disabled and elderly community and to share the importance of earthquake preparedness and safety to keep them safe in their home. Um, being able, you know, for them to be able to exit their home safely um, at ease with these simple, easy steps to install these fastening kits. Um, like I said, we did receive 20 of them and we installed 20 of these kits in each um, client's homes. Um, we installed fasteners in bookshelves, dressers, living room, living room shelves, behind television entertainments, um, along with installing the, correct me if I'm wrong, um, is it the sesame latch fasteners, if that's how you pronounce them, um, into kitchen kitchen. Seismo latch. Seismo latch. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Um, what we learned from this was that um, we learned that the greater need, it, it was a greater need to educate our members on the potential hazard in their home during an earthquake and how to, and how our members are making small changes to stay safe in their home. Um, yeah. Yes. Um, that's pretty much it as far as my presentation. Um, I did have another colleague that has joined us as well. Um, I'm not sure if she wants to say just a little bit of her part. Um, if not, that's pretty much it for our presentation. Okay, thank you. Good morning, I'm Cindy Woody. I'm from the Spring Knolls 55 plus community in Marietta, California. And we um, have tried to promote being safe in our homes. Um, years ago, we had a emergency response team, but in 2019, Alan Hansen and myself kicked off our version for our community. Our hope is to prepare our residents for emergencies of any kind with training, information, organization, and by obtaining supplies such as smoke detectors and these furniture straps that we were kindly received in our award. Uh, we received our straps less than a month ago, but we have already um, outfitted our community library. And I believe there is a slide for that. Um, a lot of people use our library, and so this will protect them if an earthquake would happen while they're there. Um, these bookshelves get very heavy, and we would not want them to fall on people. It also gives them an example of how these can be used and makes them more comfortable with installing them in their homes. We received our straps less than a month ago, but we, as you can see, we've already outfitted our library. And we have many people on our list right now to have the installation of these straps in their homes. And we will be doing that within the next couple of weeks. We feel that these supplies are gonna help make our residents safer. And we also received shingles, but that was just a couple of weeks ago. We will be filling those out in future um, area coordinator meetings that we will have. We sure appreciate these awards. We appreciate being a part of this organization. And that's all I have, unless there's any questions. Lucinda, you mentioned shingles, but uh, many people may not know what that 
refers to. Okay, that's the brochure that we fill out um, with our Back your neighborhood program. Yeah. Yes, we had done something similar to that on our own, but we will be um, changing over all of our neighborhood areas. We break them down into like homes of 15 to 20 and our area coordinators for each area will actually be sitting down with their residents and putting those together. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, Marcel, if you could turn your camera on. A camera is on. Good morning. Can everyone hear me? Good morning. Like to test. Good morning. My name is Marcel Herrera. I'm the Community Relations Officer at the City of Palos Verdes Estates Police Department. I also serve as the Emergency Services Coordinator for the city. We are located between LAX and Long Beach. We are one of four cities on the Palos Verdes Peninsula. We are the only city with our own police department. Everyone else is sheriff. Um, we're a population of just over 13,000 residents with 25% of those residents being 65 years or older. And I'd like to first thank Mark and the ECA for this grant opportunity. We certainly appreciate it. We're a small city um, with a small budget. And so these opportunities really do make a difference for us. Um, if you'll stay on that slide for me for a moment, thank you. So we know that with a, a population of 13,000, we're just about 5,000 households. Seems like it's a really manageable uh, entity to be able to bring this to every household. Uh, of course, we all have our own challenges, but we were grateful to receive the 250 Map Your Neighborhood booklets. Um, and we have, as you can see from our scheduling, our flyer, we've kind of updated the image a little bit to try to combine it with our um, Know the Drill, which I'll talk a little bit about. Um, also our Know the Zone, which is a, a program that LA County is starting to do as far as knowing an evacuation zone. So we wanted to kind of complement it and bring it as a uh, comprehensive package for our community so they're not feeling as though it's multiple programs. Uh, it's really kind of one program and this is one entity within that. Uh, when I talk about buy-in for this program, I really needed to ensure that we had longevity with the program and launching it and keeping it uh, maintained. And so I met with our Neighborhood Watch program, which here is a nonprofit uh, group. I also met with our uh, volunteer police volunteers, one being our disaster district program volunteers. Um, they have people who've taken CERT training, community emergency response team training, and we've positioned uh, caches of containers of um, um, supplies throughout the city for volunteer support uh, following a disaster. Uh, and those volunteers with DDP actually manage those supplies and train uh, regularly. Uh, they also partner with our neighborhood amateur radio team, our NART members, of which we're lucky to have about 60 um, members. Uh, and they have radio equipment at each of those containers and our emergency operations center. Uh, our last volunteer program that really is instrumental in ensuring this program is our PDE CARES program. That is our senior program. It's an opt-in program free to senior uh, residents 55 and older or dependent adults. Um, it's an opt-in registry system so that we can uh, be aware of where those at-risk population is and are. And so as it ties into uh, Map Your Neighborhood, um, certainly as we talk about uh, knowing who your neighbors are, we certainly want to know those seniors that might be found on those neighborhood blocks as well. And so um, we had held our first Train the Trainer event uh, a couple of weeks ago and uh, received a good response, uh, not an abundance of response, but as this slide shows, um, we all have challenges within our programs. Uh, we're certainly not immune to that, but we know that working within our existing Know the Drill campaign, um, as well as again, Know the Zone and now Map Your Neighborhood, that our residents are, are the first line of defense for themselves. If they're engaged and know what to do, uh, of course, I think we all know it's somewhat organic following a disaster. And I share that with people, certainly it's organic, but if you know a little bit more what to do, you're gonna be able to support your program that much better. Some of the challenges we faced were uh, engaging um, the population. So partnering with those existing volunteer programs has certainly helped um, reach the message a little further than a city message. Um, 
And then uh, certainly we've got some events scheduled. So our marketing efforts are our city newsletter that goes out regularly, our website, um, events that we're going to be holding in combination with Neighborhood Watch and our individual requests from residents. So you can see those that have either been completed or that are currently scheduled. So again, I thank the uh, ECA very much for their assistance in us educating our residents. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marcel. Good morning, everyone. My name is Brenda Bank. I'm the business operations manager for Bristol Hospice, the Northern LA branch. Um, we are a branch of 147 throughout the United States, but hospice is a nationwide hospice company. We're located in Glendale, California, and our company mission is embracing the a reverence of life through hospice care. We care for patients that end of their life with life expectancy of six months or less. Uh, our website is listed for everyone. And much like everyone has mentioned, part of doing this project was very exciting for those involved and it really piqued the interest for other uh, members within our group. We moved to a new office prior to the COVID outbreak in 2019, just in the midst of setting up to make sure that our office area is visible and safe for everyone that approximately 45 employees that enter and exit through the office daily. And we also have volunteers that come from DD, MR, and challenged young adult agencies. So we want to make sure everyone was safe. We did a walkthrough as a group, which kind of piqued the interest again, got more buy-in. And I think that's very important because previous to establishing this award, we basically participated in the great Chico in October. And for a couple of weeks after there was interest, but then it dies down. So by having events throughout the year, I think we're gonna be able to keep that interest up. So um, areas of concern that were brought up were cabinets, bulletin boards, pictures, filing items that had not been secured. We went through and we have worked on that. We've started installing our products and we have such a wide variety of products such as the uh, electronic ones. So on that area, we've let the staff themselves install those. So that way they're participating, you know, on a level and they're in step. If you look at the next slide, the walkthrough we did, we started at the office and we kind of just basically went through the office, walked into the office, we went through and identified different areas. And once the products came, we had another meeting and shared with ways with the products. We're very happy to participate in this. Our project currently in the process of installation. Um, our finished photos are not available, but we're very excited to have received this award we look forward to participating more with this group. Thank you. Thank you, Brenda. And next up, up is Oswaldo from Tech Hospital. Good morning, everyone. So my name is Oswaldo Montiel. I work for the Department of Safety and Emergency Management for Keck Hospital of USC. Uh, Keck Hospital of USC is a 401-bed acute care hospital we're adjacent to LA USC Medical Center, uh, which we are located east of downtown LA. In fact, from the top of the helipad, we can see the top of Dodger Stadium and we can see the skyline. Uh, we oversee the safety and emergency preparedness program for the organization to ensure that we meet local, state, and federal regulatory compliance. Uh, for emergency management, that is a focus on mitigation, preparedness, response, and recovery activities. Next slide. So we, so what we, 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 the project that we had was secure a healthcare clinic. Uh, the goal of the project was to ensure that uh, an ambulatory care operations continue in the event of a large earthquake. 
uh, we want to make sure by keeping these services open, it helps the healthcare, the hospitals in the air region to decompress. So it ensures that the patient population that we have doesn't stress them out. So by ensuring that we keep the, uh, by keeping the clinics open, uh, we can help the, the healthcare uh, initiative for, that, for the region to ensure that all our clinics are uh, open. Um, the project was to improve the earthquake safety for the area. Uh, the equipment that we did receive was consisted of file cabinet anti-tip fasteners, cabinet door latches, uh, monitor anti-tip fasteners, tabletop equipment fasteners, and heavy equipment fasteners. Uh, the beneficiaries of the, of the project consisted of the staff and the patients that received the radiation uh, therapy for this clinic. And again, by minimizing the damage to the building space, the clinic will be able to continue operations and treatment. So the status, uh, highlights of the activity, uh, the, the engagement from clinical leadership was outstanding. Uh, we, had, we had weekly meetings. Uh, we had teams meetings to ensure that uh, we were on track. Uh, it also gave, it also what we found, it gave us an opportunity to develop and implement an earthquake safety mitigation program that we can utilize across the organization. So we consist of three hospitals and over 80 uh, clinical locations. And, and by doing that, what we can do is we can budget for the year and purchase some of this equipment to ensure that uh, a lot of our heavy equipment that's on, uh, in the clinics uh, will, be, uh, will be useful after a large earthquake. We'll be able to maintain operations. Um, some of the lessons learned so was aesthetics, aesthetics, aesthetics. It, in fact, it led the conversation, trying to juggle the installation of the earthquake assist uh, equipment to keep uh, uh, the staff safe. With an artistic approach, it does give a new meaning to beauty as pain. So we had to really learn to listen and, and try to, uh, we wanted to make sure that the staff were safe, but at the same time, uh, make sure that the equipment was out of sight. So we, we use an old military old military saying out of sight, out of mind to ensure that we'll keep you safe, but we'll make sure that you can't see it. Uh, so uh, the equipment that we had, upright equipment fasteners, we found the picture that you see is a bed warmer. I mean, a bed, I'm sorry, a uh, blanket warmer. So we were able to anchor that uh, bed war uh, linen warmer. Next, uh, we had uh, computer monitor anti-tip fasteners. So we were able to secure a lot of our computers. Uh, these computers, uh, these are the type of computers that the computer sits in the back of the monitor. So it's a one, one I guess it's called a one all. I, I'm not sure what the name is, but so we were able to secure the computers as well as the monitors. Um, large printers, each one of these large printers cost about $5,000. So we were able to secure uh, quite a few of these large printers. So uh, with these tabletop fastening systems. And of course the automatic cabinet door latches and we were able to install 10 of these cabinet door latches within the clinic. So it was, uh, it was a good, uh, good project. It, it, ta it taught us some things um, how to, since we're going to run this with other, uh, in other clinics as well, now, now we know how to approach it better to ensure that they're aware that, uh, you know, that we'll make sure that this equipment is, is out of sight, but we will be able to ensure that uh, the clinic operations are, are maintained in the event of a large earthquake. And that is my, my presentation. Excellent, thank you very much, Oswaldo. Thank you. Next, we have Brenda Smith. Hi, good morning, everyone. So I'm Brenda Smith, I'm trying to start my video. Okay, here we go. <laughs> Hi, everyone, I'm Brenda Smith. I'm from Northeast Valley Health Corporation. Uh, I'm the program manager for environment of care and emergency management for the organization. I mean, if we can move to the next slide, please. So a little bit about our organization. So we are based in the San Fernando and Santa Clarita Valley. Um, as you know, we have a lot of fault lines coming through these areas. Um, we definitely uh, uh, had some damage during the 94 earthquake to our flagship site, as well as our corporate office. I hear stories from our bosses that after the 94 earthquake, payroll was being done in a parking lot out of the trunk of a car because our corporate office was red tagged. So definitely earthquake preparedness and mitigation is an important thing in our organization. I um, mean, it really is what 
prompted the organization to build my position um, to have someone really dedicated to emergency management. So a little bit more about our organization. We have 16 health centers and one mobile health clinic. We have services from adult medicine, pediatrics, dental, women's health, behavioral health, podiatry, lots of services to underserved communities. We also have 13 WIC facilities, which is the Women's Infants and Children Program. And we currently have four administrative offices, two corporate or warehouse and a WIC administrative office. We're currently in the process of opening up a fifth administrative office because we're growing so quickly. Um, so definitely a lot of facilities to make sure are prepared for, for these earthquakes. Next slide, please. Uh, so for the ECA mini grant, uh, we requested a $500 secure health care clinic package. Um, although we are good about, you know, having our anything above four feet fastened, um, we have been getting some new equipment. Um, we're getting, we've been securing grants and so we've been getting new refrigerators. And so we did find that there was a gap and we needed to make sure that some other items uh, were also fastened. Uh, so the items from this package are, were used at our flagship clinic, which is located in the San Fernando, uh, in the city of San Fernando, which again, uh, that was one of our facilities that did receive damage during the 94 earthquake. That site is located near the San Fernando Fault, the San Andreas Fault, the Santa Susana Fault, and the Sierra Madre Fault. So definitely a place where we want our staff, our patients, our visitors to be safe and be prepared. Um, staff... In addition to fastening equipment, um, we wanted to provide our staff with educational materials, including the seven steps to earthquake safety. Um, and we also wanted to create a list of items that they should have in their emergency kits at work, but also provide them with tips on emergency items for their car and emergency items for their home. Uh, we wanted to conduct a drill uh, at, at the facility and we wanted 100% of staff to participate in drop, cover, and hold on. Next slide, please. So really quick update on the mini grant. Again, we're really thankful for the secure healthcare clinic package. Uh, as a result, our facilities team were able to ins install items from the package, including the refrigerator fasteners. Although we do have a policy again that everything above four feet needs to be fastened for whatever reason, our refrigerators were not fastened. Um, so those, the items from the package were able to fasten some of these large refrigerators as well as refrigerators in our staff lounge, our vaccine fridges. Um, we also uh, installed some of our countertop fasteners on our printers um, to make sure that you know they stay in place during an earthquake. Um, and this last picture does show that staff did participate in the drill. We held the drill on April 29th uh, during an all staff meeting. Um, we did ask all of our staff to drop, cover, hold on. We reviewed the seven steps and we provided each of them uh, with a handout that talks about some of the items that they should have in their emergency kit at work. Uh, so right now, what we're currently working on is making sure that they bring those items to work um, and again, have an emergency kit. But again, really thankful. Thank you for the grant um, and appreciate your time. Thank you, everyone. Brenda, thank you very much. And if you haven't already done so, please go ahead and register your drill at shakeout.org as you can have uh, your ShakeOut drill on any day of the year. And of course, you could also have another drill on ShakeOut Day. Okay, next up we have uh, Comina Academy. Hello, good morning. My name is Selena Valori and I'm the head of school at Comina Academy. I first want to thank you for the grant we received from Earthquake Country Alliance. It really helped us further push our uh, school to be a safe place for everyone. Comina Academy is a school that's been around for four years and we're dedicated to supporting students who have communication challenges. Think of individuals who have autism that are unable to speak, have unreliable speech, people who need AAC devices, iPads, and other communication boards. We are a school that's dedicated to supporting them and giving them opportunities to use that throughout the school day. Um, we have a big focus on safety because all of our students are disabled. And one of the things that we do is that we have a lot of earthquake drills and fire drills so that our students are not only um, cognitively aware, but their motor system can support them in the event of an emergency. Uh, we've been able to participate in the California ShakeOut and 
We're very grateful to, to receive the grant now and help our place be safe. Um, we received the 500 Secure Workplace Clinic package. And with that, we were able to, first of all, secure filing cabinets and make sure those are well drilled into the walls. We were able to also secure the televisions for each of our students. We use large television monitors as adapted computer monitors for students with vision challenges. So imagine that you want to read a book and you're unable to read small print. We would use a whole TV screen to create to replicate that book and allow someone to read, uh, which basically creates individual hazards for each classroom, right? So now we're able to have those be secured. Uh, we were also able to use a putty to secure small items on surfaces like walkie talkies and other um, things that have to be at the desk at all times, but can also shake and break in the event of an emergency. Um, if you want to jump to the next slide, you can see some of the pictures of what we installed. Um, and of course, we also have our small library that has a ton of books. Having those straps that go in the front of the bookcases is very helpful so that if they do ever tip, nothing falls out. We were also able to secure the whole bookcase to the wall so it doesn't tip too far if that does happen. Um, thank you so much. Thank you very much for your presentation and your uh, work. It's all, as all of you are doing, this really showing how important this work is to do. And next up, uh, Candy, are you there? I see you, but you're muted. Yes, good morning. Can you hear me? Yes. Good morning. <laughs> Sorry about that. My name is Candy Alvarez, and I am the Emergency Preparedness Coordinator at Health Center Partners of Southern California. We are a consortium of primary health care organizations serving the communities of San Diego, Riverside, and Imperial Counties. We have 17 organizations in our membership, and collectively we serve 170 sites. <coughs> Since 2002, our emergency preparedness and response program has assisted the health centers in preparing for public health emergencies uh, by bringing together all of the coordinators. Uh, we collaborate on a wide range of topics such as compliance, training and testing, policy and procedure development, business continuity, best practices, and just making sure we are actively participating in county operations during emergencies. Next slide, please. So the name of our project is When Health Centers Shake, with the goal of increasing the awareness to our members about the risks of earthquakes and how important it is um, that they apply mitigation tactics inside of their health centers. Um, the package we were awarded was the Secure a Healthcare Clinic uh, using different types of fasteners and a gas uh, shutoff wrench from Ready America. Here you can see some images of the items we received. And the beneficiaries of this award were two of our health center organizations. Uh, we have Father Joe's Villages and Neighborhood Healthcare. So Father Joe's Villages is located in downtown San Diego and they provide medical and dental care as well as housing to the homeless. Uh, Neighborhood Healthcare is a nonprofit organization as well. And they have 17 locations in uh, both San Diego and Riverside County. And they provide medical, dental and behavioral services. So we are continually evaluating the success of this project um, by surveying uh, the participants as well as the other 15 organizations um, periodically on their mitigation efforts. Um, and we continually emphasize uh, just how cost effective and easy it was to implement um, these items. And this way they can uh, create their own non-structural mitigation project. Um, and we continually use this project to give them ideas on what they can do inside their facility. Next slide, please. So here are some fun highlights, <laughs> lessons learned. Um, these were pictures taken at the clinical site at the Father Joe's Villages campus. Um, and also you'll see some pictures of a walkthrough that we did um, in a warehouse that was designated uh, just for PPE at Neighborhood Healthcare. 
and so some lessons learned. Um, so funding for mitigation efforts is one of the biggest challenges and a main reason why it is not uh, usually a top priority at many sites, even though earthquakes is always one of the top five hazards. Um, but I'm confident that through coordination and support, we can help our members with their mitigation strategies. So our beneficiaries were very grateful for this funding opportunity, and I hope that in the future they will continue to secure their any new facilities. And thank you to the ECA and to Ready America for all these products. Thank you, Candy. Uh, uh, excellent work as always. Uh, you've you've had many awards a couple years and continue to expand the work that you're doing and the types of projects that you do. Um, I uh, our our next uh, recipient is not able to join us. She's a principal of a elementary school, and you can imagine quite busy this time of the day. Um, I must say, I'm very, uh, very pleased to see this application uh, as uh, this is associated with a, a church that I went to with my grandmother growing up in San Diego all the time. So, uh, but uh, they are a it's a, it's a church school, um, and of course, everywhere is important to be securing, including schools. We haven't had a school presentation yet today, uh, but we've, we we do have many award packages for schools. And uh, and Jennifer Miller is actually a new principal, and so really wanted to look at safety and all, uh, across all issues, um, and uh, to receive the mitigation materials like we've been uh, seeing today to secure the classrooms and meeting areas and and, and administrative areas, etc. Uh, and so, just a couple of pictures that uh, she sent so far of the work being done: securing file cabinets, uh, a microwave. Um, and a, a refrigerator in, in the break room. All of these very important to not fall, fly, or or or, or be damaged and hit people. Of course, in the, the type of work we're doing, here's a, a really good example of securing a, a monitor uh, to the surface that it's sitting on, and to uh, and to keep it from moving uh, in an earthquake. You always want to with these adhesive pads. Uh, these are designed to uh, attaching to the object and to the item that it's sitting on. You, you never want to uh, stick these onto the wall. They'll just peel, all, peel, all, peel right off in the, in the earthquake. They'll, uh, it'll basically break the paint and, and stucco away. You only want to drill uh, through the holes that you see in these straps, a bolt into the stud within the wall. So this is a really good example of using the, the right materials. Um, Next up, we, we don't have a slide and we don't, unfortunately, weren't able to get your video, but I do have um, uh, just a little slide here. Uh, Therese Catus, if you want to uh, talk about your project briefly. And just turn your camera on and your, and your sound on. I see you here. And Therese, just you're still muted, almost there. Great. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, Thanks. there you go. <laughs> um, I am sorry. The original video I had, my camera got smashed. So <laughs> sorry, we had to do a quick stop this morning. But um, yeah, thank you. So far, we got the rocket books. Oh, let me pop it from here. Um, Live from the child care. I, I was having such a hard time getting my videos and stuff going. The original video I made, I crushed my phone with everything in it. So <laughs> we did a quick stuff this morning, but so far we received uh, rapid books for the kids. They, um, they did all the inside drawing and following of the what to do in case of an earthquake. We are a small daycare of eight children located on the southern part of uh, California, uh, San Diego. And um, we, we uh, attend so many classes with the ECA learning how to secure the home while the children are here. They're here like 11 and a half hours for the day from six to 5.30. So we have a long time with um, eight little ones for aging from age three months to 13 years of age. 
I prepare the children for preschool and um, teach them about safety while they're here and at home in case of an earthquake or any type of disaster, what to do, how to stay calm. And um, I am very thankful for ECA and all the incentives and other items they send for us. And um, we other my other incentives are on the way, but uh, we get to, get to work in this wonderful book, which they love. And um, they did they read and did all the projects in it and uh, know how to prepare themselves, how to prepare a bag and uh, put it under the bed, hooked it on so it don't get lost during any kind of disaster with earthquakes, what to put in there. So they answer all the questions I ask. They know what to put in their bags to stay safe and how to um, prepare themselves during an earthquake. So um, I didn't get all my other stuff. So I didn't have much pictures to show of what we're actually putting up on the walls to hold the TVs and all that, but they do. They do read the book and understand. We also get an ECA and we look at videos of earthquakes happening. So they have a good understanding of how to be secure while they're here, how to get out the house, um, where to meet up if we ever get um, dislocated from each other. So uh, I am just waiting for all the other stuff to come in and uh, we're gonna start putting stuff up on the wall to hold the TVs and uh, bookcases and whatever else we have up. And I do wanna thank ECA because financially it's really great of uh, a help to the daycare in enhancing everything we need in here. And um, I think Grace, that's- thank you so much. <laughs> and thank you for your guest appearances here. Uh, and uh, yeah, I know the, the 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 fasteners are on their way, so uh, yes. it, it's great to see who that's protecting uh, Thank you. you and them. <laughs> Thanks again. Um, all right, so uh, we have one other um, recipient who was not able to join us today, uh, and so uh, just to mention that uh, a community out in uh, Del Webb. Uh, received a, 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 a 10 living spaces secure package. Um, so I, I also did put the link to the Rocket Rules materials where you can order those or download those. A lot of great resources for, uh, for young uh, children. Okay, so um, just to uh, keep things moving, um, I, I wanna uh, remind you that we can uh, you can put questions into the chat, and there have been a lot of great discussion and comments in the chat, uh, back and forth. Uh, so be, definitely look there. Uh, Mark? Yes. There was just one question um, asking how people can find out about the, the next uh, application cycle so they can share with their leadership. Yeah, really the best way is to be on the ECA email list. Uh, to get the notification when that will come out. So earthquakecountry.org slash join. Um, and then also uh, it will be at earthquakecountry.org slash mini awards uh, when that's announced. We're going to try to get that up earlier this year, have the application earlier. Um, and there may be a longer period of time to complete projects next year as the uh, funding source from FEMA is going to be for a longer time. So um, that will be good too. We, we're uh, also going to have support for additional uh, similar projects for independent living uh, facilities across the state. So if you're with one of those types of organizations or know people, um, uh, be on the lookout for that announcement as well. So, uh, all right, uh, did I put something wrong with the Rocket Rules link? Gabby, if you could, um, make sure to put a correct one in there and maybe it's earthquakes uh, or something. I, maybe that was uh, what was on. I'm gonna go ahead and introduce uh, Margaret Vinci and to provide our quakes break. Thank you, Mark. So this report is gonna cover the events from our last meeting in mid-February to actually yesterday. Uh, next slide, Mark. So Caltech. 
Thanks. Caltech with its Cal OES and USGS partners runs the Southern California Thank Seismic you. Network and monitors earthquakes from no. Paso Robles to the Mexican border uh, with a network of ground and GPS centers. Unless uh, UC Berkeley and USGS monitors events to the north of San Luis Obispo and together we are the California Integrated Seismic Network. Um, next slide. So all of the earthquakes that we monitor every day are actually archived into a database and you can get any of that information is available to anyone at our website at scebc.org. So the last quarter has been relatively quiet, actually very quiet, with only a few magnitude 3.5 earthquakes or higher and with no significant events. Some of the most noteworthy events in the last quarter were on March 22nd. We had a magnitude 3.4 earthquake near Ontario. Some of you may have felt that. It was felt by many people uh, as far west as Huntington Beach, uh, Rancho Cucamonga, Fontana, Ontario, uh, because it was a very shallow depth. It was only 4.5 miles deep, meaning that the waves traveled across the surface. And so people actually felt that 3.5 earthquake because it was relatively shallow. On April the 14th, we had a magnitude 4.5 event in El Sazel in Sonata. This was actually close to the border, so it was felt by many people in the San Diego area, and it actually triggered a shake alert for the people living in San Ysidro. On April the 19th uh, through the 24th, we had a five day swarm of events near Brawley. This is not unusual for this area. This They have these swarms. It produced over 60 earthquakes during that five day period, anywhere from magnitude 1.2 to a magnitude 3.7. And again, this is not unusual for this area to have these swarms. What do swarms mean? We have them on a regular basis. What do they mean? We really don't know. They start and they stop. Uh, usually it's small ones uh, that occur and time will tell as to whether this is any indication of something larger that's ready to come. But so far they usually start and then die out. Uh, yesterday we had a magnitude 3.6 earthquake during, uh, near Julian. This was felt by about 700 people that registered their what they felt on the Did You Feel It earthquake tool. Um, and so that one was yesterday. Next slide. So the Mexico event uh, is actually a reminder that although our, we talk about California and Southern California earthquake risk, we also have to realize that earthquakes occur outside of Southern California. Our fault, faults don't just stop at the border. So we get events that are in Nevada, but also many events from Mexico. We have to remember that in 2010, the El Mayor Cucapá earthquake, 7.2 intensity shaking of seven, uh, was create, created uh, damage to many of the buildings and irrigation systems in the Imperial Valley. It also is part of the Laguna Salada fault system that is creating our Gulf of California. So as the as our tectonic plates move and the Pacific plate moves to the north, it that Gulf of California is getting larger and larger. And of course, this is where a lot of our earthquakes come from. And so it isn't just fault in California, but it's fault in other regions that we need to worry about as well. And so uh, remember that we do have these earthquake tools so that uh, earthquake uh, offshore was in Baja and Sonata. And actually for, uh, we had 4,600 hits and responses of people that felt that earthquake from that one in Ensenada. Next slide. So these are some of the resources that you can go to, some of our earthquake tools, remembering to use those so that you know where earthquakes have occurred. Uh, also to download the ShakeAlert apps, whether it's MyShake, QuakeAlert USA, um, SD Emergency, Google Android, and WIA will then bring you the ShakeAlert earthquake early warning uh, to let you know that shaking may be imminent. And also to use the Did You Feel It as to what you felt uh, that helps us with our science uh, of being able to be a partner with that earthquake. And these are some of the site you can go to after that earthquake to find out what happened and how you need to respond. So we look for a quiet quarter for this year too as we move forward uh, into the next quarter. I'll turn it back over to you, Mark. Hello. Thank you, Margaret, very much for that update and for doing that um, the quakes break each meeting. Does anybody have any questions about earthquakes in the region uh, for for Margaret, or uh, or about uh, perhaps about uh, 
shake alert, earthquake, early warning, uh, my shake and the apps. Any questions about that? All right. I want to point out that we do have a survey of today's workshop. So uh, before you leave, be sure to uh, complete that survey. We'll put the link to that survey in the chat. Uh, and uh, very brief, uh, but we, we really do look at your answers in terms of, of uh, how you, uh, uh, your feedback for the workshop, your suggestions for topics, and you're also able to indicate if you're interested in any leadership uh, positions within ECA, um, whether uh, within Earthquake Country Alliance Southern California uh, or uh, on one of our statewide sector-based committees. Uh, and uh, I see some questions uh, from Laura Jones. I'm new to the group, so just want to be sure I can be part of the big shakeout. Yes, of course. Just go to shakeout.org slash California and you can register uh, your organization or your household or both to participate uh, and learn uh, all about what to do um, there. Also, earthquakecountry.org slash step five has all the background on what to do to be safe during earthquakes to um, uh, make sure that you know how to drop, cover, hold on if you're able to, or uh, alternate uh, recommendations. If you're someone who uses a wheelchair or other assistance device, we have guidelines on what we call, um, uh, uh, as shown here, this image to lock your wheels, lock, cover, and hold on. Um, and this is in Armenian. This is showing our different languages here, but uh, at the website there uh, uh, in the chat, You'll find that and links to uh, videos on what to do to be um, uh, 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 safe during earthquakes uh, called our earthquake safety video series. And uh, we have a number of uh, resources there uh, for, for uh, that's step five, that's during the earthquake as part of this, the overall, uh, if you join late seven steps to earthquake safety. Uh, and then there was another uh, comment. Uh, let's see. Uh, uh, Clan, I'm wondering, you've, you've been commenting in the chat. If you could, uh, could introduce yourself and, and say, uh, would you mind saying a little bit about the comments you've been adding about the HMGP opportunity and what that means? You bet. Uh, thank you, Mark. I'm Glenn Granholm, my vice president at Safety Proof. Um, I've been working primarily with uh, nonprofit food banks around California um, with this program, with this grant program that's from FEMA uh, and administrated by the California Office of Emergency Services. It's called the Hazard Mitigation Grant Program. Their acronym is HMGP. Uh, again, administered by Cal OES. So uh, if you just Google HMGP California, uh, you will get a link to the Cal OES website. Those funds, which are put in a bucket for lack of a better word, every time the governor declares a state of emergency, um, and California has a lot of states of emergency, so there's plenty of buckets of money available specifically for earthquake structural and non-structural retrofit for government entities and nonprofits. If you own the building, you can qualify for the structural and non-structural retrofit. Uh, there's a new category for emergency generators that has just been added. Uh, if you do not own the building, you still can qualify for the non-structural retrofit. That includes uh, many of the items we've reviewed today, uh, furniture, uh, also different types of equipment, racking, suspended ceilings, fire sprinklers and essential rooftop equipment also are included as part of the HMGP grant program. It's pretty complicated. It takes a while to administer. Uh, and in most cases, you're gonna have to get a building permit, but that all those costs, as well as the costs to prepare uh, the grant um, request, that paperwork are covered uh, and so you can get, also get grants to prepare your grant. Uh, anyway, uh, Los Angeles County or Los Angeles Regional Food Bank 
got uh, several million dollars for the retrofit of their Vernon campus. Uh, and now we're working with other food banks uh, in particular to just to give them guidance on how to access the money. That's it. Thank you, Mark. Um, Glenn, if you could put your um, email address into the chat, then people can follow up with you on um, that. And Alan, you're saying he's on, but I'm not saying, uh, Daniel Zapata, are you with us now? Okay, yeah, we're, we're uh, waiting for I'm our- here. I'm here, no, I'm You here. are, okay. I yeah. just Sorry, I was trying to unmute myself, I'm here. Um, oh, I wonder if you've joined with Alan's link, and that's why I'm seeing Alan twice. Uh, oh, 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 and that's why it. I didn't see that you were here. To uh, all right, that's why. Yeah, Alan. Yeah, it's always on these meetings. You don't want to uh, share links, and uh, okay. So let's. Uh, you want me to? Uh, you want to send me a new link? And no, you're me? you're good. You're good. I'm going to spotlight you, and we'll be able to. Thank you, Glenn, uh, and. Um, yeah, we were kind of uh, having Glenn filling because I didn't know you were here yet, but you had your presentation. I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing and allow you, um, I'm going to make you co-host so that you can share and uh, you are good to go. If you're able to share your slides. Okay. Do you mind if I introduce Daniel now? Go ahead while I start go ahead. sharing again. Yeah. Perfect. Well, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce my friend Daniel Zapata. Um, I've known him for uh, quite a few years, and he's been an uh, excellent resource. Uh, he received his master's degree in structural engineering from the University of California, Berkeley. He's a licensed structural engineer and a principal with Digging Kolb Engineers. With 20 years of experience in seismic evaluation and seismic strengthening of existing buildings, Daniel's product our project breadth spans large medical centers, civic buildings, and privately owned structures. Daniel has traveled to multiple countries to conduct post-earthquake reconnaissance. He is a past chair of SEOC, Structural Engineers Association, Existing Buildings Committee, and current SEOSC, that's the local organization in Southern California, Existing Buildings Co-Chair. Daniel is also a member of the SEOC Resilience Committee, CALBO, California Building Officials Organization, Structural Safety Committee, and an associate member of ASCE 41-23. He is also assisting multiple cities in the implementation of their seismic ordinance programs, including Santa Monica, Beverly Hills, West Hollywood, Pasadena, Culver City, Torrance, and LA. And uh, I wanna thank you again very much for joining us in our presentation today. And, um, I just wondered who came up with that really clever title for your presentation. I don't know. I'm some really smart guy. I heard. <laughs> <laughs> so th thanks, Alan. Um, you want me to get started now? All right. Can you guys hear me fine? Yes. Yes. Good. Okay. Great. Uh, thanks for the invite, guys. Um, I uh, Alan Alan uh, came up with this really cool uh, title and but I, I did talk to Alan and I said you know I think it would be nice for me to give an overview of all seismic ordinances across the state not just the soft story and and, and he thought that that was a good idea so it's going to be a little bit more than soft stories but uh, I hope that it's still you know uh, it's still uh, a pretty good information for you guys I will say that I feel like I'm preaching to the choir after hearing the introductions up front um, I'm, I'm used to speaking to folks that are either not very uh, knowledgeable about our seismic risk or are actually in denial. So um, it's, it's nice to be in this, in, in this group. So <clears throat> as all of us can, you know, as, as many of us know, you know, since we live in seismic country, um, earthquakes have happened since, you know, since the, the beginning of time here in, in this area. We've had some pretty notable earthquakes uh, in, in recent history from 1906, 1925. You know, 1933 was a really big one in, in Long Beach. It actually created some legislation that, that introduced legislation so that we can um, design schools more appropriately. Um, in El Centro, uh, that was the first earthquake that was actually recorded, uh, which is really, really useful for us uh, geeky structural engineers. Uh, the 71 uh, San Fernando earthquake actually uh, was also a, a very important earthquake. It, it introduced legislation 
um, so that we can design hospitals uh, a, a lot more stout than what we used to design them. Uh, we continue to have earthquakes in, uh, you know, in, in, in Whittier Narrows. I, I remember feeling that earthquake. Um, it, it did have a lot of collapses. Uh, this is a, a photograph of uh, a, an area, a, a building that used to the, the collapse. And, and here's what it looks like now, which is just basically an empty parking lot. Uh, the 1999 Loma Prieta earthquake was another significant earthquake that we had in Northern California. Um, it reinforced an idea that we that we that we had observed before, which was you know these these really um, bulky buildings that have this this weak ground floor, which we now refer to as soft story. Uh, it really highlighted those types of buildings. And they continue to be highlighted up uh, you know in 1994, here's another building where the where they where the, um, the building collapsed on top, on top of this tuck under parking. Um, it also, this 1994 earthquake also highlighted, uh, you know, uh, what was wrong with uh, steel buildings, uh, with, because before we used to just kind of focus a lot of our attention on concrete and masonry. <clears throat> Unfortunately, a lot of our buildings haven't, haven't been um, corrected, haven't been strengthened yet, you know, in, in, in the Napa earthquake, we still saw significant damage on, on some of our URM buildings. Uh, and then we continue to see uh, damage, you know, every time we have an earthquake, this is the 2019 Ridgecrest earthquake um, that I actually visited and, and visited the hospital that was, that was completely shut down. All the patients were relocated because of all the non-structural, all the non-structural uh, elements that happened um, here on the right side is a school that, that had a lot of, um, a lot of the gas, um, uh, tanks, you know, that fell down. Luckily, not, nobody got hurt. So, you know, one of the things that, that, that we as the engineering community have done is that after every earthquake, we learn something. And we, we like to write things down and we like to uh, put codes together. Um, and, and what our observations have shown us is that there's what we call vulnerable building types. Uh, we actually have a checklist uh, in our standards that actually show you know, these are the types of things that we have observed during an earthquake that, that we should probably should fix. Um, and it doesn't require a lot of calculations. It's some pretty basic checklists that engineers use to, to do a, the first evaluation of a building. And <clears throat> what that allows us to do is kind of put buildings in, in different categories. You know, some of the most important categories that we have seen are, you know, cripple wall, seal plate-ish uh, uh, buildings. So ba basically, uh, residential buildings that have this uh, that have elevated foundations and in, in an earthquake we see them that they they actually collapse on their side um, and the way we fix those is that we hire a contractor and we strengthen that cripple wall and we anchor the foundation you know nice and tight to the to the actual um, uh, I'm sorry we anchor the the cripple wall nice and tight to the foundation Another type of um, building that we that we absorb, uh, uh, observe a lot, which is the title of the presentation, is what we call soft story buildings. In reality, soft story is a deficiency that happens in not just wood buildings, but it happens across any kind of any kind of uh, building type, any kind of uh, material. It just happens that we focus our the the current focus and the the focus in the in a lot of the ordinances that have been up um, uh, passed is on the wood, uh, wood construction, because those are the ones that we have seen have collapsed the most often in, in, in earthquakes and are, are probably one of the, one, the riskiest ones and easiest ones to, to, to repair. This is a typical uh, damage of a building after a collapse. This is a building that, uh, a modern building that, you know, that, that show that type of vulnerability and then this is a, a very typical retrofit, which is you put uh, some moment frames, some steel moment frames in that in the area where it's weak. The idea here is that you're you're trying to strengthen the the most weak, the weakest part of the building. Now it's extremely important for everyone to realize that just because you strengthen that part of the building doesn't mean that there's other parts of the building that will not fall uh, or fail in an earthquake. It just happens that we target the most critical deficiency, but you can always do more and more in these buildings to make them a lot better. Non-ductile concrete buildings, these are the buildings that, you know, the, their, their, their concrete elements just don't have sufficient reinforcement in them. They don't have enough, uh, enough reinforcement. 
they, they don't have the, as much reinforcement as we uh, as we use today. This is a typical reinforcement element, uh, how it was reinforced in the past. You can see the, the, the black lines here represents rebar. And today we would put a lot more than what we used to. And what that does is it creates this brittleness in the material that tends to break. And the way we fix that is uh, we add more concrete, more walls that, that have a lot more reinforcement, uh, or we use some new technologies like this fiber wrapping, which um, make up for the lack of reinforcement. So there's a lot of different techniques that you can use to fix those buildings. We have pre-Northridge steel moment frame buildings, which uh, uh, it got its name because of the Northridge earthquake, which is when we actually um, noticed this deficiency. And what happens is that the connections that we used to use in, in the steel buildings are actually relatively brittle. Um, and, and, and that's for various detailing and, and type of welding that we used to use in the past. And one of the, a typical way of retrofitting that would be to add braces and that those braces could either be rigid braces or they could actually be dampers, which are similar to what you have in your, in your car, which abs absorbs the, the, the motion of the building. Or we could reinforce the connection. Uh, it, it really depends on the building uh, and what is more most appropriate. Uh, <clears throat> you know, uh, another type of uh, deficient building that we that we observe is what often is called tilt-up buildings. But in reality, it does. It's not just for tilt-ups. It happens on any kind of concrete building or masonry building that it, that has a very flexible roof attached to it. And by flexible, I mean something that's uh, made of either wood or deck or metal deck that doesn't have concrete. And what happens is that the connection between the wall and that roof tries to disconnect uh, as the earthquake is moving it back and forth. And the way that we repair that is we go in there and we, we strengthen that connection by putting some rods. You often see those, um, those, those retrofits in your communities by observing these these plates that penetrate the the the, the actual um, the actual wall, and then finally the last one that, that we like to target as an engineering community and as a and legislation is the URN uh, buildings, which is unreinforced masonry units, and these are these are prime probably the most uh, uh, dangerous buildings of them all. Uh, they they just they really really just don't have a lot of strength. And any any kind of shaking will, will, will cause some damage. Um, and the most common thing that, that happens to them is that they actually, uh, again, similar to the to the previous uh, uh, slide, uh, they disconnect from the roof and then they fall over. So sometimes we do we this is the most common, but oftentimes we actually do have to reinforce the wall themselves. It really depends on the thickness of the wall. So, you know, so those are the vulnerable building types. Those are the buildings that we're really, really concerned about. Uh, what I get asked about is, okay, Daniel, but I mean, I don't see these buildings falling every day. What's, what's the big deal? Well, you know, I, as, I, as I mentioned before, um, we live in earthquake country. Um, we, the hazard is, is, real, is, is with us every day. Uh, we, 90% of the earthquakes happen in this part of the world, and we happen to be right in the ring of fire. Um, you can track, you can, you can go through history and just observe all the main, all the, the biggest earthquakes that have happened around the world usually happen around here. And we haven't had major earthquakes in a very populated area. I mean, we did have Napa, we did have Ridgecrest, but you know, fortunately for us, they, were, they did not happen in a, in, a, in a very populated area. So we haven't had one of those uh, since the 94 earthquake. <clears throat> and, you know, we, we are, if you look at the shakeout scenario, if, if we do end up getting one of these large earthquakes in, in, the, um, in, in our populated area, we're gonna, we're gonna see a big um, devastation in our communities. The last time we saw this was in 1994, you know, 30, 30 people died in 1994. Um, the, at the time, it was considered the, the, biggest, um, the, the biggest loss uh, due to a natural disaster in U.S. history. I mean, it cost, it, cost, um, it depends on, on which numbers you read, but it cost uh, over $12 billion in structural damage. I think this 47 also includes some, you know, some other, other aspects of the damage because it's not just structural, right? It's loss of productivity, et cetera. Um, this, this graph, I really enjoy uh, looking at it because it, it shows you the amount of people that lost um, 
that were in shelters right before the earthquake. And then immediately after the earthquake, you see that we lost a lot, that a lot of people just were basically homeless. I mean, there's reports they used to walk through neighborhoods and, and, and they were basically like ghost towns. <clears throat> you know, more, more on big picture community, uh, what happens is that um, people migrate when, when there's a big seismic earthquake uh, and they don't want to, and, and they're afraid of, to live in that area, they, they go somewhere else. There is an argument by Lucy Jones that, that part of the reason that uh, LA became so populated is because there was uh, all the folks that migrated after the 1906 earthquake to Southern California because they felt that, you know, San Francisco just wasn't a, 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 that vibrant city that it once was. So what can we do about it? Um, one of the things that we often do is create legislation. And what I get asked is, well, does this legislation actually work? Here's an example of a, uh, of a seismic program that was actually, uh, sorry about that, um, that was actually done in Taiwan. I visited Taiwan after their earthquake and they actually had a seismic program and, and they, had, they, had call, they, had, they were in the middle of it, they hadn't finished and they, had, they were examining school buildings and they, they had in their program called 334 buildings safe. And out of those 334 buildings, only one of them was damaged uh, after the earthquake and the damage was actually fairly minor. Whereas 75 buildings that were called unsafe, 18 of those were, were damaged. Now, you know, uh, engineering is not a perfect science because, we, you know, we can't predict earthquakes. Um, but, but nonetheless, I think these are this is a pretty good evidence that, that these things, that these types of programs do, do, uh, do work. So the first thing that we need to do if, if we want to develop a seismic program is, is really define what are we trying to achieve? Are we trying to... Uh, just simply repair a, a condition um, that, that was broken, that was broken in a past earthquake, or are we trying to upgrade it so that it doesn't break in a future earthquake? And the reason I want to make that distinction is because after 1994, a lot of the buildings that were damaged, uh, actually there were ordinances to go out there and repair them. And that meant that they, all they had to do was bring them back to their previous state. And that was not a strengthening uh, ordinance. And there's a misconception in the community because a lot of folks say, well, I, I, I know that this building was repaired. I mean, was retrofitted in 1994, but they may be, they may be misunderstand. And, and, and in reality, it was simply repaired, which means that it could have the same damage in another earthquake. So we have to make sure that the er ordinance that we're talking about is clear. The other thing that we that, that I, I want to make sure it's very clear is that we want to make sure that we are talking about the right scope. When we talk about soft story ordinances, specifically in Southern California, you know, Southern California targets that that bottom op exterior open line, and there's a lot of politics behind why that was selected. Um, and it's it's really what it's saying is that let's target the most vulnerable. Uh, line of the building that, that is that is that needs attention, but it doesn't address all other parts of the building that could have severe damage in an earthquake. Uh, in San Francisco and the the Bay Area communities, you know they they can stomach a little more, and they said, "Oh, we're going to target the entire story," um, but it's never in it's, it's never as good as targeting the entire building. And some ordinances ordinances do target the entire building. It really depends on what you're trying to figure out, what you're trying to fix and how much can the community stomach. And, and by that, I mean, there's, there's interruption to business as you retrofit, there's also cost of the retrofit, et cetera. So you have to be very careful when you talk about seismic ordinances in terms of what they target. Um, <clears throat> so I'm gonna step through uh, some of the different types of ordinances that exist currently. Uh, we do have voluntary ordinances to, to repair those cripple wall buildings. Um, they traditionally uh, basically give you uh, some standard plans that anyone in the community can go to their building department and then pick up a, a set of standard plans that can help them uh, uh, fix their building. And the intent is to make these repairs as easy as possible. There are wood soft story buildings that, that, have, been, um, that have been targeted uh, since 1994. We initially had in the 90s a lot of voluntary seismic ordinances to repair these buildings, but we soon realized, and not soon, but it took us a little bit actually of time 
to realize that these buildings, that it takes more than just a voluntary ordinance to make this happen. In 2013, San Francisco passed their soft story ordinance to address uh, their, their risk. And then in 2015, the city of Los Angeles followed. Since then, there have been a significant amount of uh, uh, cities, uh, well, I shouldn't say significant. There, there have been quite a few uh, major cities in Southern California and Northern California that have been targeting seismic ordinances. Uh, Los Angeles, uh, Santa Monica, West Hollywood, Beverly Hills, Pasadena, and Culver City have all passed um, soft story ordinances. Uh, this figure, what it shows you is I was, um, I was trying to convey that depending on the city that you're in is, is the nuances of the ordinances. Um, in some cases, they're targeting you know, this line, but not this, or, or this, but not that, et cetera. And that was really dependent on the type of building structures that they were that, that, that those particular cities observed when they did an inventory of their of their of their um, risk. The the city of LA currently, you know, they they've already gotten um, past their 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 permit um, their deadlines to to issue permits. Um, there there's pretty much they're on their they're on their way to complete the program. In the next couple of years, um, you can see here that 7,000 buildings have already been retrofitted, uh, and then 4,000 are already in the middle of either construction or or, or in the middle of um, just closing them out. So they're doing a pretty good job, you know, pushing pushing that program through. Santa Monica is in the middle of, of it. Uh, they got delayed by COVID. Um, this they have deadlines that are posted on their website that actually uh, got moved a little bit. Uh, because of COVID. Um, there's the URM uh, uh, ordinances. Uh, there's, there's the URM buildings that actually have an ordinance. Uh, I'm sorry, let me rephrase that. There's the URMs, which actually had legislation, state legislation that was passed in 1986. And that legislation basically said that all communities across the state had to develop a program. Um, it got updated in, in 1990. And then what, what we saw out of that program is really uh, a significant push to reduce the risk across the entire state. Um, this little table that's included in, the, in, in one of those reports actually shows that about 98% of the URN buildings were, were retrofitted to some standard. And I say some standard is because the cities did have their did have the ability to, to dictate what that standard was, how much retrofit they needed to do, et cetera. But um, you, could, uh, you could see, again, um, there, there's some pretty good numbers here, but not everyone is done. Uh, the city of Santa Monica, for example, when they did their seismic ordinance, they, the, they said, hey, we, we got to address those those handful of URM buildings that haven't actually been retrofitted. So they, they, they put those priority and I believe they did complete those, the, the, the last few that they had in their inventory uh, that needed retrofit. There is tilt up ordinances. I mean, the, again, these are the buildings that are primarily concrete or masonry that have, have a tendency to separate from their, from the, that the walls have a tendency to separate from the, from the roof. Um, those have had some ordinances uh, that were instituted back in the 90s, uh, primarily by the city of LA and some Bay Area um, uh, jurisdictions, and they did capture a, a significant amount of buildings and reduce their risk. But other cities, unfortunately, haven't followed through until recently. Uh, the city of Santa Monica, again, also had a really comprehensive program and they they decided to also address that type of building and and now and then we're in conversations with other cities as well to to hopefully address that um non -ducto concrete buildings um you know th these are the these are the big huge buildings that are the that happen in larger cities and and these are heavy buildings um that if one of those collapses is, is gonna severely affect uh the city uh, in 2008, from 2008 to 2011, there's an organization called the Concrete Coalition that went out there and surveyed cities across the state just to get an understanding of how big of a problem do we have with these types of buildings. Because of that report, in 2015, the city of LA actually uh, issued a seismic ordinance because they felt that that report showed them that the, that the city of LA has a significant risk 
in their books. So they wanted to mitigate that. Um, the city of Santa Monica soon after said, you know, we want to we wanna also follow uh, the city of LA and implement similar guidelines, similar any similar ordinance to improve, the, to improve our community. And then in 2017, the city of West Hollywood did the same thing. Um, <clears throat> the numbers are not as significant in terms of how much they have done. These are a lot more complicated buildings. This is the status of the LA program. And you could see that not a lot of buildings have gone through the program. And again, these are much bigger buildings. They do have a 20 year program. So it is gonna take quite a bit of time for us to address that, that risk. Um, the city of Santa Monica is also, uh, also has some pretty long-term uh, dates for those, for those buildings. Uh, to actually be addressed, but but it is in the works. And then, you know, um, uh, similar to that are the, are the, are the steel buildings. Uh, and what I was saying before that, you know, there's a misconception that sometimes um, oh, folks believe that, oh, that building was actually uh, fixed in 1994. This is what, this is what happened in 94. In 94, we saw a lot of these steel buildings actually crack, uh, the connections crack. And there was a mandatory ordinance to go out there and inspect them and then find the damage and, and, and repair it. Uh, you could see that about 60% of the buildings that were inspected has some level of damage in the, in the LA area and those were repaired. But unfortunately there wasn't really, there was never an ordinance in the city of LA to actually strengthen them to a higher standard. It was just a repair ordinance. But Santa Monica, both Santa Monica and West Hollywood both have said, that they want to address that 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 risk, and they both pass uh, ordinances in their in their communities. So that is a summary of really all of the seismic ordinances across uh, across the state of California. Um, I'm gonna say I'm gonna direct you to our Degenco website. In our Degenco website, we actually have um, a list of all of the ordinances uh, across the state. Um, the, and, and it gives you just a very high, high level picture of what, is, uh, what, what has been passed uh, or, what is, in the, or, or what, is, what is voluntary, what's been in the process or what has been passed and the type of ordinance that, it, that, that the cities are, con uh, are considering. You know, this is a significant effort and you can see that there are a lot of, there's a lot of good work being done by, by many cities, but unfortunately, there's a lot more cities out there that need help. Um, and there's a lot uh, of cities that are still considering it. Northern California has, has done, uh, uh, has also gotten uh, uh, a lot of cities that on, on board and are trying to mitigate their risk. One of the things, one of the typical themes that you will see in both Southern California and Northern California is that a lot of cities are targeting the wood soft story as a priority before they implement other ordinances. Um, in, in the Pacific Northwest, I just wanna mention them because they also are in that ring of fire. They are also doing a lot of their ordinances, but they are primarily focused on- Hi, more. Susie. Um, I think we got somebody in, <laughs> yeah. Um, can you guys tell me how much, how we're doing on time and how many minutes we have? About five more minutes, Daniel. Okay, sounds good. Um, we're good. <clears throat> so current activities. Um, you know what we're doing. What what's happening, and specifically uh, in the state of California, um, some cities are still working on their on their ordinances. The city of Torrance right now is in the process of, de of developing ordinances for multiple building types: soft story, non ductile, pre Northridge steel. And uh, I call it rigid wall. These are the these are the quote unquote tilt up buildings. I don't like to call them tilt up because they 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 are for more than just tilt up. Uh, the city of Long Beach is scheduled to do a survey on similar building types. Or uh, Torin, the first step to do a, an ordinance is to do a, a survey. Then comes the ordinance. So Long Beach is is a little bit behind on that because they're going to start with the survey. But nonetheless, they are scheduled to do that. ATC, ATC, if you're not familiar with them, it's an organization that does a lot of research uh, for seismic uh, programs and, and seismic um, uh, codes and standards. Um, they, are developing a, they are developing proposed non-ductile concrete and rigid wall ordinances for the Bay Area. 
Um, Seattle is working on their URM uh, technical provisions. And there is, if you, uh, I'm sure you guys have talked about it, there is a proposed assembly bill that will fund about $2 billion um, uh, into, the soft, into the wood soft story programs across the state. I say $2 billion because it's, it's, it's supposed to give $400 million worth of funds over five years. So that's how you get the $2 billion. But again, this is still a proposal. It hasn't passed, but uh, I figure I, I, I just let you guys know in case you haven't heard about it. Other things we can do and, and, and people have talked about is, you know, people are wondering, hey, should we have a star system very similar to, you know, where you, when you go buy a product, there's always a star system that says, hey, this product is good and this product is bad. Should buildings have a star system that it kind of tells the public, hey, this building is good, okay, or bad? Um, it's a very controversial program because it, it, it really depends on what criteria you're using. So it, it, it is out there. The USRC is, a, is an organization that is promoting that, um, but it's, it hasn't really uh, taken, um, become as popular as, as one would wish. And then there's other talks about doing like a board program, which is uh, you can only imagine when the city actually gets a seismic uh, uh, event, the city is probably going to be overwhelmed and they may not be able to respond because they're not going to have enough resources. So this is a way for the, for the uh, engineering community to team up with the city and focus on certain buildings um, uh, that, are, that are critical to the community. So, so this, is, this program is, is, is in development in many cities as well. So with that, um, that's, that's what I got for you guys. And, and hopefully I didn't bore you with things you've already knew. <laughs> Not at all, Daniel. Thank you for your very comprehensive uh, and interesting presentation. Um, we do have time for questions for Daniel, and you can um, either put your question in the chat, or if you know how to uh, raise your hand within the reactions menu, click the raise your hand, and then you can just speak your question. Uh, we do have comments uh, about the presentation. Uh, Glenn has mentioned that at earthquakebracebolt.com, uh, you can see if your home is qualified in, in a qualified zip code to get the $3,000 grant that may be available to retrofit your crawl space, your cripple wall uh, crawl space. So you can look for there. That's a program through the California Earthquake Authority. And, um, and uh, uh, Daniel, you mentioned the AB 1871. Um, Right, is that the right number? Um, is is there a way that people can? Or 17, 1721. Thank you for calling Magnolia Student Center. Uh, Irma, you're on. You're, you're not muted. <laughs> uh, I I just did. Uh, make sure to keep yourself on mute, everybody on the call. Um, there we go. Uh, and I know you're all very busy and 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 and, uh, and everything, uh, but um, okay. So 1721. Is there a way that that individuals or organizations can uh, you know help uh, that that ordinance or that that bill get passed? Is there any advocacy that can be done? Um, so I uh, I would recommend that you. I mean, you can obviously reach reach your your representatives. Um, mm -hmm and and express your support um, that's that's one easy way to to kind of try to make a difference uh, another way is also to reach to the well at least i can tell you that the structure engineering association of california is monitoring this bill and is also providing technical feedback to to you know to the proponents of, of the bill so you can, I, I think you can, um, you can get to, you can influence the bill yeah. in, in various ways, but uh, I'll be frank, I'm not a politician, so I, I, sure. I, wouldn't, I wouldn't know what the best way of doing it. I can just tell you that those are the two ways. Those are great, great, great ideas. I'm wondering if anybody who's on the call uh, might live in one of these types of buildings, the, the apartment building or maybe a condo that has the parking uh, spots uh, along the maybe the back or the front of the building, and it has your building been retrofitted or not? Uh, just to and, uh, and and what if it was? What was it like as that work got done? And are you more? Uh, do you feel more safe? 
Anybody? I don't live in one of those buildings. However, um, after the earthquake, or the 94 earthquake, my husband is a contractor and he actually did some retrofitting in the Northridge building. Yeah. That had the parking underneath and that involved many of the things that our last speaker spoke about, jacking it up and then putting in the beams, putting in the metal beams at the fronts of the, the garages. Um, the right. people at that time were not living in the places, um, but towards the end, the end of their product, they, and, oh, sorry, the end of the project, they were actually living in the homes when the work was being done. So. Thank you, Brenda. Yeah, and actually, Mark, you know, the, the, the way that these programs are set up is they're intending, they're intended to minimize the disruption to, mm -hmm. to, to the folks that are living in the, to the residents that are living in the buildings. So the intent is to try to do the, the work from the underside without actually having to move folks out of their homes. Um, that, is, that is one of the reasons why I mentioned that you really have to understand the scope of the program because when you, when you look at, uh, depending on the, on, the, on, the bill, on the ordinance and what they're trying to target, one of the reasons that they, that they are doing the least amount of uh, strengthening as possible is because they're trying to minimize the interruption to the folks that are living in the area and in, in the building. So it's, I, I think it's a very important thing for us to remember because you, you are obviously, if you fix the entire building, it's, you're gonna get the greatest, the biggest safety, the, the, the biggest risk reduction of the building. Uh, but it's going to cost a lot more and it's going to interrupt, uh, you know, the folks that are living in every one of those units. So, so it's a, it's a, it's a balancing act as to how, how good do you want to make the building? Thank you, Daniel. Uh, all right. So, um, Glenn, do you want to ask your question? Sure. Uh, yourself? Thank you, Daniel. And something you mentioned just, uh, Spark my memory about that um, NPR prog podcast on the big one. You you, you seem to indicate that um, steel steel uh, frame built high rises in LA might be vulnerable because there aren't any new ordinances and really all that happened after Northridge was an inspection of damage that was corrected. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Should I be afraid to go into a, one of those buildings? <laughs> well, Glenn, I can tell you that my office and I spent, you know, 50% of our lives, we spend it in our work, right? My office is in one of those buildings and my office host is that we have, uh, we have like 30, you know, structure engineers in that office. So we feel pretty comfortable. And uh, I don't think that these buildings are going to necessarily come down in a seismic event. Um, well, let me, let me rephrase what I just said. We have not observed in past earthquakes that these types of buildings um, have the same risk as a concrete building, right? They don't have the same, they, they don't have the same risk of, of collapse as a seismic. Uh, uh, no, I would say that, you know, our past observations are limited, right? We won't, we've only seen so many earthquakes affect these types of buildings and the earthquakes that have affected them have been far away. They haven't really been very, very close. So it's not that the it's not that the hazard doesn't exist, and not that the risk doesn't exist. It's just that when you were if if you were to prioritize which of the buildings are the most uh, the riskiest ones, uh, you would probably put something like URMs up at the top, you know, in non ductile concrete and soft story, and then and then the steel moment frames will kind of fall towards the bottom based on previous observations. What we saw in 94 is that the connections broke. If you break enough connections, yes, the building can suffer significantly. And could there be a collapse? I mean, anything is possible, yes. But in terms of the, the level of risk and which ones are the most dangerous, those are, at, at least to our current knowledge, those are not it. Um, they, they, the, one of the good things about steel is that it could, it could take a lot 
of bending and, and moving to to actually bring one of these steel uh, buildings down. So uh, it's not a great condition. It's not something that we want to leave alone. I think another way of looking at it is there's two things that we look at when we when we are trying to decide on a seismic program. One is life safety, right? How, how much risk do we want to reduce of this building? And the other one is community resilience, right? After an event, how fast do we want to get back in that building and use it for its intended purpose? And one of the problems with these steel buildings is that if they do have these broken connections, it's, it sh we, should, we should not be occupying them after an earthquake until they're fixed. Because we don't know if we're going to get a big aftershock and maybe the first earthquake, the major earthquake that broke the connections, you know, didn't have this, this co collapse or partial collapse. But what happens if there's another, you know, another, why take the risk, right? So we're going to, we're going to evacuate and then we're going to have to fix the building. So we have to also think about what is it going to do to our community resilience and not just pure safety. And that's why some of these, some of the, some of the, some of the communities, some of the, some of the uh, cities that are actually addressing uh, steel buildings are thinking in that fashion, not just about safety. Long right. answer, sorry. <laughs> Daniel, we have uh, just a quick question. Do you know if uh, South Pasadena has a uh, Tucker or parking building ordinance um, yet? The city of Pasadena does, but I don't, Believe, I think South Pasadena is a separate city, if I recall. Yeah. And no, they do not. Not to my rec, not to my knowledge. No. All right, Daniel. Thanks again for a great presentation and for answering these questions. We'll go ahead and move to the next part of our meeting. Thanks for joining us. No problem. And Mark, I'm gonna sign off, but uh, I do appreciate the invite. Thank you. Thank you guys so much for listening. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, so uh, just a, another reminder about the survey for our workshop, um, and um, that's here, we'll put in the chat again. And I also see a comment from one of our colleagues with the California Earthquake Authority, uh, Andy Ertz, and if, uh, who'd like to make a quick update. Uh, go ahead, Andy. Thanks so much, Mark. Good to see you. Haven't seen you in a while. Hopefully it'll be in person sometime soon. Okay. I appreciate the plug for EBB. Thank you. For those of you who don't know me, I am the managing director of the Earthquake Brace and Bolt program. That program provides a residential uh, grant or grants to residential um, homeowners to retrofit a specific vulnerability. That's the crawl space vulnerability in their homes. We recently were awarded a significant amount of additional funds from FEMA for our program. So our last registration had over 13,000 people or about 13,000 people registered. We'll be able to accommodate all of those people who were interested in the program and we'll be opening up an additional registration sometime later this year. We also have added what we are calling a supplemental grant for income eligible homeowners. So there'll be about 3000 of those available for people to help pay for up to 100% of the retrofit cost. And later this year, we'll also be opening up what we call our earthquake soft story program, which is for single family home uh, residences. And it's that living space over garage vulnerability. So we'll be opening that sometime late this year. So look for that as well. Uh, we also had submitted an application under BRIC, which is Building Resilient Infrastructure and Communities, also a FEMA grant program for the type of vulnerability Daniel was discussing a little bit ago, the soft story vulnerability in small uh, apartment or condos um, up to, to uh, what did we do, up to 10 units per building. So we also have an application in for that. And we are providing technical assistance to the authors of AB 1721 upon their request. So we're very well aware of that program as, as also. So if there's anything else I can answer for people about those two or three programs or topics, happy to do it. Thanks, Mark. Yeah, any questions for Andy about 
what she just shared. Um, yeah, this is uh, Alan Hansen. Andy, just curious about the soft story uh, type of condition with the dwellings over the garage. Um, is that going to be in the specific zip codes as well, or is that more of a universal program? That will also be in specific zip codes. We did not get a huge grant for that, so it'll be in a much smaller area. Currently, our EBB program is 395 zip codes we participate in. And when we open up later this year, we'll add additional zip codes as well. This will be more of a pilot program for us, so it'll be in much fewer zip codes. Okay, that's good to know. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. And so as we continue, thank you, Andy. Uh, uh, does anyone else have a short announcement they like to make about any uh, uh, earthquake related activity or resource or program uh, that might be of interest to the attendees? And you could uh, raise your hand uh, or just speak through, uh, turn your mic on and speak. Um, Mark, this is Alan. I do have one announcement just about the upcoming webinar for the San Diego and Imperial County areas. So we're uh, making a push uh, in those areas, and I was glad to see all of the many award recipients that were from uh, San Diego. But um, we're trying to uh, engage even more with those folks down in the southern area. So when we make that announcement, we'd like to uh, get uh, both the people that are um, were on the call today, plus others from San Diego, on the webinar. So again, that's going to be specific to uh, the San Diego area. We have uh, Celestino Alvaro, or I'm sorry, Alvaro uh, Celestino from Dingy Cult Engineers as well. That's going to be speaking on the Rose Canyon Fault scenario. Thank you, Alan. And uh, one way to make sure that your friends and colleagues and others in the San Diego area will know about that is to either forward the announcement on when you get it or make sure that they join ECA at earthquakecountry.org slash join. Uh, other uh, announcements? Okay. Uh, Mark? Yes, Lance? Uh, yeah, uh, just reminder to everyone that the ECA Speakers and Events Bureau uh, can often, not always, but often provide speakers either online or in some cases in person and uh, tables at preparedness fairs or events. Uh, if you go to earthquakecountry.org slash events, you'll see an option for clicking on a form that you can submit, provide all the information about your need, and we'll evaluate it and see if we have the capability to to meet your needs and, and provide either a speaker or a table. We can't do everything, but, but with the, within the limits of the number of volunteers we have available, we would certainly try to accommodate. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Lance. Lance is um, one of Mark, the coordinating committee uh, for, uh, for SoCal and in charge of the Events Bureau. Mark, this is Heidi Rosowski. Hi. The other thing I'd like to say and piggybacking on what Lance had said is that um, there is some expertise within our, our uh, volunteers and, or, and, and staff organizations that have uh, the ability to um, put together presentations that are have specific me uh, messaging. So for instance, uh, for people dis with disabilities or seniors, where there might be some modifications in messaging that, that the uh, that we do have the ability to connect with partners and people that are, are a part of the organization to ensure that the messages that you are uh, that you want your audience to receive in terms of things that are specific for them that we can do. And it's also been suggested that I'll show this again a reminder that we do have. Uh, materials in 15 languages at earthquakecountry.org slash languages uh, and now special uh, uh, individual web pages for each of those languages that you can direct people to. Um, the, uh, Heidi was mentioned, mentioning uh, materials for people with disabilities. These uh, documents are all created uh, with all the accessibility aspects included. So uh, the download uh, PDFs are 
um, able to be read through screen readers with people with low vision uh, and, uh, uh, and uh, all the other aspects that go into making sure that these can be uh, accessed by as many people as possible. Uh, we uh, uh, do have some of these printed, especially these uh, uh, kind of like postcards. Uh, so if you would like to get some of those, go ahead and email info at earthquakecountry.org. Uh, most of the materials are meant for you to uh, print, uh, but let us know if you have a particular event coming up where you're going to have a lot of people and we can work together to get you resources. Um, okay. Uh, as we, any, uh, anyone else have any uh, quick announcement? All right. Well, then we will uh, really just opening up um, to uh, general discussion and questions. This could be, you know, not, not any question, but earthquake or tsunami related, if there's something that you wondered about or you're kind of wondering about uh, from an earthquake science, mitigation, preparedness, uh, suggestions for resources. And I'll turn it over to our chairs to kind of interact uh, in, in this as we enter a uh, meeting coming up or scheduled to go until 12.15. Yeah, and I think one of the things too, if anybody has any shakeout information, if they're planning any shakeout events, thinking about doing it, we'd love to hear about that and, and love to help you with it. But i uh, like to hear about some of your plans that you might be thinking about for shakeout. Um, or if you have any suggestions for topics for future meetings as well. And this is your time to share whatever you want to share with the other members of ECA. So do we want to use the hand raising or putting a question in chat or a comment in chat? We can, uh, we can, we can uh, make sure that we uh, give the opportunity for, uh, for those of you that have something to share. The, the other part that I would also say too is that even with the mini award, uh, the discussion of some of the mini award uh, programs that, that uh, the report backs were on today, if they have sparked an idea for you, to, for either your organization or an or what you want to take back to someone as a potential project is certainly, we certainly want to hear about what you're thinking about that as well. Anybody have any comments or that they want to make or questions that they want to ask answered? I think everybody's afraid to talk. Well, <laughs> I think I think they're thinking about all the information we've thrown at them today. <laughs> it's it's Glenn from Safety Proof. I just got to say I am so inspired by award winners or any other organization that is teaching children about earthquake safety. I just mm -hmm. love that rocket rules, uh, and you know I think about um, like how it is we move the needle on recycling in this country. It was really through the, uh, through the elementary schools, teaching kids who came back and basically guilt tripped their parents to do recycling. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't care if kids are guilt tripping parents to do earthquake uh, bracing, uh, just so it gets done. So, uh, you know, great job. Anybody involved in teaching kids about earthquake safety, uh, truly inspiring. Keep up the great work. Underscoring what you said, Glenn, when we when we table at earthquake preparedness fairs, it's the kids who know what to do. Well, and I think making them the advocate in their homes, uh, it gives them a purpose. It gives them something. Kids really want to have something that they're in charge of, and so it's a great way for them to be in charge of putting, being in charge of of making sure that their homes are secure, knowing where their safe places are and taking on that responsibility. And then they have that skill for a lifetime. It's no accident that a great majority of the participants in the Great Shakeout are schools. Most schools throughout the state participate and that's why children go home and, and teach their parents um, what to do. The other nice part of that is that, you know, the generations that are coming up with this information uh, are going to be the parents of the future. So as as they as they have 
uh, awareness and understanding of what to do, you know, we will hopefully move the marker of uh, our communities to be more and more resilient as uh, the young ones that are coming up with this idea uh, begin to take their place and in the in the great great the great uh, group of people, you know, of the rest of the world. And in California, take out has been happening for what, Mark, 14, 13, 14 years. So the kids who, who were learning it in first and second grades are now enter, getting out of college and about to start families. So good on us. Did anybody, uh, uh, you know, that's one audience that, that we certainly try to reach out to. Did anyone else have another audience that they were interested in uh, targeting any information for or that they work with that they'd like to uh, share information with? This is Cindy Woody from Spring Knowles, and we're a 55 and older community. And I just think the education is good. And as the kids learn, they bring it up to their parents and their grandparents. Um, I've only lived in California for four years. And I've noticed that a lot of people have, oh, it's not going to really happen. They keep saying this and, oh, it's not a big deal. You know, they've kind of become lax in their feelings about earthquakes. And I think that when the children come and their grandchildren come and start talking to them about it, or when we do our presentations and training, it kind of makes them think about it again. Just like sometimes when we have some small shakes, um, it kind of gets people, well, maybe it might happen. Um, I'm from the Midwest where there's a lot of tornadoes. And it's true, you know, the, the warnings come out and the watches come out and people just are kind of like, oh, it won't hit here. And Sometimes we just need to be reminded that it can happen at any time. So I appreciate all of your um, knowledge and, and expertise that you're giving all of us every time, every day. Thank you. Lucinda, what, one of the things that I do um, when I, as I, I, a lot of my work is, is in uh, what we call access and functional needs populations, which includes seniors. And one of the things that um, as a senior myself now, you know, as you get older, it's like, don't give me anything for my birthday, come to my house and take two things away. So, uh, but one of the things that I have often said in when questions come up is grandparents and parent and, and uh, uh, adult, adult children are looking for what things to give or do for their parents and grandparents. Um, that they don't necessarily need. So one of my things is to, you know, get a gift certificate to uh, have a handyman come and work um, and install some of this to your house. You know, do the kinds of things where it may not necessarily be that you're gifting a thing that they just know <laughs> want, but you're kind of gifting them with some safety and resilience by having someone come in who can help install some of these uh, um, uh fixtures that are out there to help make safer, safer space. Thank you. Yes, we've had um, numerous people since we've done our trading and I know Margaret's familiar with our community, but it's, it's amazing how many people for Christmas have gifted their children and grandchildren with to go bags. Yeah, that's one of the things. Another great one. Mm -hmm. So, um, and that's another thing you can do for some of these seniors, because a lot of them maybe don't have the ability to get their things together and get organized is go in and help them for a day. And, mm -hmm. you know, as a, as a member of this community, we, Alan and I see that a lot. And we fortunately have people that are willing to go in and help some of our older people that cannot get around as well, but it's, you know, helping each other. And that's the one thing we've really tried to establish is community and, you know, teaching people and trying to help people and spreading the word. So thank you again. You know, we, we, you've hit on something too that, that we always try to um, reinforce and that is in larger scale disasters, your first responders are gonna be your neighbors, which is why the Map Your Neighborhood community programs and, and CERT programs are so critical because that's who your response people are going to be when the stand, the people we consider to be primary responders have larger uh, larger goals that they must accomplish rather than what's happening to you on your block. Yes, that's true. And um, I know personally myself, I've 
been I've gone through the CERT program three times. You learn something new every time. And proud to say that most of our area coordinators are also CERT trained. And those are things that people don't think about, but it's an important, um, it's an important help to get people educated in any way that we can. You know, and uh, oftentimes I've heard people who say, well, I can't do CERT because I can't lift or I've got a bad back or this. There are positions within that CERT program that they can fill that doesn't necessarily mean it has to be physical. And that's, again, part of that resilience is finding out what the skill set in your community um, is and how that can be um, you know, looked at in terms of building the more resilience in the community within the, the, uh, the folks who have the talents they have. I agree. And we even were lucky enough that we actually had a CERT program put through up here for our residents that was basically for seniors. That wasn't quite as physical, but it gave them a lot of the knowledge and people that could do things, learning what they can do and what they can't. And it was amazing too that so many people thought there were things they couldn't do. And after the training, they realized they can do it. Uh, and Heidi and, and Cindy, as speaking of people being involved, uh, we have more than 50 people on the call still right now. Uh, if there are some of you who are experienced in speaking about disaster preparedness and earthquake preparedness and would like to participate with uh, Earthquake Country Alliance in our presentations, in our tabling at, at various events, or in providing, for example, 20-minute speakers for Rotary Clubs or, or other groups or organizations. I will put my contact information, my email information in the chat box. Let me know and I will get in touch with you and we'll see if, if you need any extra training or if you could participate in some of our events, especially in the next months coming up, leading up to ShakeOut, we're going to get more requests. The Thank other you. the other thing, too, is within the committees that we have that we were talking about, the coordinators that we have, if there is a committee that you want to work within that you may have a, a particular knowledge base for that can be applied to to whatever the the the, uh, the committee is working on, please get in touch with. Uh, with us at Earthquake Country Alliance about being able to incorporate you in the work of those committees. A lot of the committees, uh, a lot of the information that we've come up with have been uh, designed for specific communities by members of those communities. So it, it's a nothing about us without us type of situation. And this might not be the place to say it, but I, I'm going to bring it up because it's all again about community and helping each other whether it's an earthquake or any other disaster. And because we started out with getting ready to help each other during earthquakes, we never dreamt that our first emergency was going to be a pandemic. And by having our community established and having our area coordinators organized, we were able to do things like we were delivering over 100 food boxes a week during the pandemic. And that's something that can be utilized, whether it's an earthquake, um, a pandemic, anything. So this training, it's wonderful for earthquakes, but it's also wonderful for just everyday life. And I think everybody benefits from it. Lucinda, that's interesting. We, we asked that question on the ShakeOut survey last year about, you know, how did uh, being uh, doing the ShakeOut prepare you for uh, the pandemic and vice versa. And a lot of people did say that um that the, you know what they got organized in their community or in their household you know for you know, for shakeout did make a difference uh in terms of their covid response so we're um at 12 16 it's a great conversation and uh we can you know stay on a little bit longer if there's other uh, other uh, 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 questions and comments just want to uh, point out again the the survey uh, and I, the website for this workshop today, I put the link in the chat uh, a little further up. Uh, that does have the link to the survey too. So if you want to just click that there, uh, that is also where the workshop recording will be within a few days and uh, maybe by this Friday, <laughs> early next week. Uh, and uh, you can email us at either info at earthquakecountry.org for statewide 
uh, sector-based committee questions and resources in the region at SoCal at EarthquakeCountry.org. Uh, Heidi, Margaret, and Alan, any final comments on behalf of ECA SoCal? Well, I just wanted to piggyback on what you were saying about uh, utilizing our resources during the pandemic. And I will also mention that our Map Your Neighborhood program, um, that that was highly used during the pandemic program because we already had the connections with our neighborhoods. And so that program was utilized with the pandemic and reaching out to all of our neighbors. Uh, also want to mention that our next meeting will be on August the 10th. So everybody add that to their calendars. And if you come up with any questions or comments or topics for uh, future uh, webinars or meetings, again, please get into <coughs> it. And uh, you know, we really want to make sure that we uh, we offer information that's going to be useful for you to take back to your organizations and communities as well. And thank you to uh, the both the mini award. Uh, recipients who spoke about their programs and also to uh, uh, Daniel about the about the uh, the bracing um, information and the the building ordinances ordinances and so forth um, we want to thank you all for that kind of information and for everyone who participated can you please re repeat that date for the next workshop uh, it's going to be on August the 10th okay and thank the, you and the one after that will be November the 9th Okay, August the 10th and November the 9th. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Great work. Thank you all very much. We do appreciate you for joining us, and I thought it was a great workshop. And thank you for attending. Yes, absolutely.